Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, um, and welcome to tonight's IOP lecture. Uh, this evening, we welcome Melissa Achida from Imperial College London, uh, a former postdoctoral researcher here at Sussex, uh, to talk about her research in experimental particle physics. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me at the back. Let me know now if you can't. It's good? Okay, brilliant. Okay, so uh, the title of the talk, as you know, is Liquid Hydrogen, 50,000 Tons of Water in a Nuclear Reactor. And it's very much a particle physicist's journey to understand the universe, to what we individually will do. And I'm going to talk about some of the experiments that I've worked on, some of the particle physics research that's going on at the moment, and also about the way that we do things. Hopefully, it's, it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Hopefully, it's, uh, it's going to resonate with a few of you. So... Um, Without further ado, what is a physicist? Well, the caricature, yes, and I think we've all probably met uh, some Sheldons in our life. Also, yes, but uh, unfortunately very few of us have, uh, have met this particular character. To a lesser degree, actually a lot of the engineering breakthroughs in particle physics are the things that go on to directly benefit people's lives, and I'll touch on that later. So there's a little bit of all of the stereotypes in us, but also just people like me. <coughs> Basically, our goal is simple, to understand the universe and everything in it, and to be the first to see things for the first time. What could be more simple? I think all of us in this field have a collective desire to understand things, to be the first to see things, to be sort of on the developmental side of things. And I, I put this picture of an apple up there because um, when I was, uh, I don't know, five or something, I remember my mum cutting open an apple and saying, Melissa, do you want to be the very first person in the world? And in fact, the only person to have ever seen something. And I was like, yes, I really do. And then she said, like, I'm not going to look. And then she showed me the apple. She went, you'll see, you're looking inside that apple and no one else has ever seen it. And uh, so now I look inside atoms. <laughs> So a bit about me, well I started off um, the physics side of my life, if you will, um, doing a maths and physics joint honours degree at Royal Holloway. I then went on to do my PhD in an experiment called T2K, which is I'm going to tell you about later, and it's an experimental particle physics uh, PhD at Queen Mary in London. And then I was a research fellow here, working on the cryo-neutron electric dipole moment experiment. Long name, you'll also know everything there is to know about all of these experiments soon, so don't worry. Uh, if you know it already, now's a good time to sleep. Uh, research fellow now at uh, Imperial College London working on the MICE experiment. And um, I've just realised something which is uh, missing from my talk. But uh, never mind, we'll, uh, we won't worry about that. So that's me, what is the universe? Well actually, it's 5% matter, that's me and you and the tables and the chairs and the planets and the stars and the solar systems and the galaxies. And it's 27% something called dark matter. And it's 68% something called dark energy. Now, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but what I am going to say is that this dark matter we know nothing about. We know it's there, we know it's matter because it has a gravitational pull, it affects things around it, it takes in light, it doesn't emit light, it has the pro ma properties of matter the dark properties of matter. We know it's there, we know very little about it. We, you can think of it, if you will, as a very heavy black box. Then there's dark energy. We know that's there, the universe is expanding, this is what facilitates that expansion. Don't worry too much at this point, you know, this is just uh, for you to basically take away from this slide that 95% of the universe we know basically nothing about. The other 5% of the universe we know something about, but we really don't understand it. What is that other 5%? I said it was us here, the people, the chairs, the tables, the buildings, the planets, the stars, the solar systems, the galaxies, and indeed it is. Particle physics, the fundamental particles, go to make up all of those things. So what you're made of is exactly the same stuff that the sun is made of. It's exactly the same stuff that the galaxies are made of. It's exactly the same stuff that the Earth is made of. When you come down to it, we really are all the same. And 
You probably all know, I'm sure everyone in this room knows that there is an atom and in the nucleus of the atom there are protons and neutrons and going around the atom there are electrons. What you might not know is that inside the protons and the neutrons there are quarks. The protons and neutrons are not what we call fundamental particles, they're not the building blocks of life. They are in fact amalgam particles, they're made up of quarks. There's uh, three quarks in the proton, three quarks in the neutron. In the proton there's the up quark and the down quark, but two up quarks. In the neutron, there's also the up and the down quarks, but this time there's two down quarks. We're going to talk a bit more about quarks on the next slide. But for now, you've got the protons and the neutrons making up the nucleus of the atom. They're made up of quarks. Around the edge of them, you have electrons. Out in the universe, you have something called neutrinos, which you may or may not know something about, but you certainly will in about an hour. And the other particle, which of course isn't on here, because it doesn't need to be. Because the other particle is the thing that allows you to see this. The other particle is the thing that allows this to have colour, the things that allows this to have shape. It's the photon. And it's the most abundant particle in the universe. But let's go on to what we refer to as the standard model. And this is going to be really one of the key things. If you want to take away something from this, memorise this slide, tell your friends in the pub, this is the thing to remember. These are the fundamental building blocks of life. You'll hear about other particles. You'll hear about kaons and size and jade size over the time. But they are all made up of other particles, the particles in this table right here. And this is perhaps one of the most fundamental and important things about particle physics. It's what's known as the standard model of particle physics. No one has been able to really disprove it for some 40 years, yet we can see various holes in it. These holes in it are the key to understanding particle physics. But also, its longevity, its ability to be correct for decades and decades is also part of this understanding. And until we can marry those two ideas together, we won't truly understand this matter. So, without further ado, I've forgotten my pointer. But thankfully, these are coloured. So the quarks are the coloured things at the top. The leptons, as they're referred to, don't worry about that, are the electrons, muons and taus, and their constituent neutrinos, which are the second most abundant particle in the universe. And if you remember from the slide before, they're that tiny little particle there that's not sitting inside the atom because it is not bound to an atom. So you'll see there's three generations. These generations go light to heavy. So generation one is the lightest and the most commonly known. So you'll see the up and the down quarks appear in this first column, and they're the ones that make up the protons and the neutrons that we know. Then there's the electrons that go around the edge, and there's the electron neutrino. The second generation are the muons, the muon neutrino, the charm and strange quarks. And the third and yet heaviest, of the three generations are the top and bottom quarks, really intuitively named here, the uh, tau neutrino and the tau. And then over here, the top right-hand corner, that's the photon. That's the most abundant particle. That's the one that allows everything to be seen and visible. Then there's what, and they are the force carriers, the gluon, the Z boson, and the W boson. Now, the only thing I want you to take away from this is that that is what allows things to interact with one another. They are what allow things to stay together, bound in a nucleus. They are what allow things to stay and to change. They are the force carriers between these fundamental particles. So that's the standard model. Now there's other things, of course. Um, you might notice that there's no explanation of gravity in this standard model, and that's one of the holes that I was talking about. Gravity isn't explained. Some people postulate that with a particle called a graviton. I'm not going to talk about that any more than that. I'm just going to say there's a postulated particle. It's called a graviton. There was also a postulated particle called the Higgs. But we found it, so it's no longer postulated. And everyone's very, very happy about that. And, of course, I will mention that later on. So we can now add a new particle to our standard model. And the Higgs is what gives things mass. So like the force carriers transfer force, the quarks go to make up larger particles, the neutrinos are not bound in the nucleus, and the electron 
goes around the edge of the nucleus, the muon being more heavy, the tau yet heavier. The Higgs allows everything to have mass. Don't worry any more than that. Just remember the Higgs gives everything mass. But most importantly, we really shouldn't be here. The dark matter, the matter, all of this is matter. And every single time you create matter and antimatter, it annihilates. If you create matter, an equal amount of antimatter is created at the same time and vice versa. It self-annihilates and it's not here. So we really do not understand. And you can take whatever explanation you like for this process because we don't understand it. But we do know that we've never been able to recreate it and it shouldn't exist. We also are pretty sure that these things called the Sakharov conditions, which were from the 70s, this man here, uh, Andrei Sakharov, who also did great humanitarian works as well as physics works, um, postulated these conditions, and I think uh, pretty much the community is agreed on them, that these things need to be in place for us to exist, and they are. That manta and antimatter were at some point not created evenly. Now that's uh, pretty much understandable. It's an obvious one. It's known as baryon number violation. I'm not going to talk much about it, but I wanted to write the proper name down so that when you hear the Sakharov conditions, and at no place does it talk about matter and antimatter asymmetry, you will remember that baryon number is that. Then there's the symmetries of nature that um, mustn't at some point have been observed. So we see things always going one way and equally the other way, the same and the anti-same. But at some point, that must not have been true. Otherwise, no matter what was created this evenly, it would be created unevenly the other way and would therefore still balance out. And in order for the process not to happen in one direction, then backwards in the same direction, there needs to be thermodynamic non-equilibrium, i.e. there can't have been an equal temperature everywhere. So those are the Sakharov conditions. And those are the things we know must not be true. So now we have to think, OK, we know what particles we know. We don't understand them. We need to find a way to try and understand how this matter came to be here. And, how it, and in order to do that, we need to understand how it behaves. We need to understand what it is. So that's one of the questions that uh, the first experiment I worked on went to try to understand. And it partly answers the question, what is a neutrino? So, neutrinos, the second most abundant particle in the universe. They are created in the atmosphere. They're created in the sun. They're created at the Big Bang and have been traveling ever since without ever interacting with anything else or touching anything else. They're what known as relic neutrinos. And they're a great lens, if you will, into the early universe. They're also created by people. They're also created by lots of other things. In fact, one billion go through your thumbnail every second, five billion in fact, and it would take an entire light year thickness of lead to physically stop one. So they're not bound to the nucleus, they just travel, they just go and go, and they go through you all the time, and there's no concern because they've always been doing it since the dawn of time, they're perfectly safe. But we need to try and understand these particles, there's a lot of them, and Interestingly, we find that they behave in a very unexpected and unusual way, that the standard model, that very important table, does not predict and does not suggest. One of the ways that we can try to understand these neutrinos is this experiment called T2K, which stands for Tokai to Kamio Kanda. Tokai is that little white dot on the east coast of Japan with uh, the J Park there, which I'm going to describe in a minute. The bl dark blue line is a beam of neutrinos traveling 295 kilometers underneath Japan. And on the left-hand side is Kamio Kande, the Super Kamio Kande detector, which is 50,000 tons of water, which is how we detect them. And there's a little neutrino event to whet your appetite for this exciting talk. So what am I talking about? You know, we've got neutrinos, we don't understand them, fine, the second most abundant, fine, they behave in a strange way. What way? Well, it turns out they change into one another. You saw from that table, the standard model, there was an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino, and they shouldn't change. And they shouldn't have mass, according to the standard model, but yet they do change into one another. We find that um, they do what's known as neutrino oscillations, and electron neutrinos can, after some distance traveled, and distance traveled is sort of the equivalent of time, really, because you see these neutrinos just continually travel through everything. And 
they change into one another. So for them to be different to one another, i.e. they're different because they oscillate into one another, they must have mass. And this is one of those possible indicators for the matter-antimatter asymmetry. If they're changing into one another, does the change happen the same way in both directions? When is the rate of electron neutrinos into muon neutrinos equivalent of the rate to muon neutrinos into electron neutrinos, i.e.? We don't know that. It's certainly the first sign of things beyond the standard model. It's the first time we've been able to categorically say, well, this is something beyond, and we need to understand it. Oh, I've answered my own question. Why do we care? Well, it's the first direct evidence. They're the second most abundant particle. So this tiny weeny mass that they have, whilst it's not a huge amount, the fact that it's there can actually have quite a big universal impact when you consider the fact that there are so many of them. And of course, there's just the pursuit of knowledge itself. Imagine if we didn't know that the Earth was round. And uh, for many, 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 many centuries, they believed that it wasn't round. It was, in fact, flat. And other than being able to sail all the way around it and fly halfway around it, you know, it's good to actually know that. It's good to understand, and a lot of benefits come from that. So there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of knowledge itself. Let me tell you more about T2K. So T2K is this experiment I started off telling you about. Why is there two parts of this experiment? Why does it go from east to west? Oh, I'm going the wrong way through the slides. Okay. Basically, we make a beam of neutrinos. We make a beam of neutrinos ourselves so that we completely understand what is in that beam. We make a beam of electron neutrinos and we say, okay, in order to be certain that the beam we've made, we know exactly how many of each type of neutrino there are, we need to count them. So as well as making the beam, in the ring, we also, that blue dot there, need to detect them at the start of their journey and count them. We then send them 295 kilometers across Japan to the west coast. The reason for this distance is that that's how long it takes for a sort of maximal oscillation to occur for the, the change from one type to another to happen at one of its highest rates. They don't need to be in a tube or anything like that. They'll just travel through the rock unhindered and uh, come out the other side. At our far detector, as it's known, near detector and far detector, and that is 50,000 tonnes of water, which then detects the neutrinos and counts them at the other end. And we literally just add them all up and work out how many are different. Simple as that. So this is the East Coast. This is this J Park facility. It was brand new in about 2006 end of 2006, start 2007. It was purpose-built to do a number of different particle physics experiments, perhaps the biggest of which is T2K. And uh, this red ring here is the proton synchrotron, as it's known, which is uh, similar to the LHC, smaller, makes a beam of protons and circulates them. And the here is, in fact, a picture of me standing in the proton synchrotron, very happily, just to prove I was there. And um, this beam of particles, you can see just behind my left shoulder there, there are some uh, magnets. And these are the things that keep the beam compact and circulating. We then need to detect the beam. We need to understand how many electron neutrinos, how many muon neutrinos, etc. are in the beam. We do that by the purpose of a near detector. Now back in 2007, it looked like this. And that is some of the most prominent particle physicists of our time, and indeed some of our most highly paid particle physicists of our time, taking a photograph of a machine that digs holes. And this is a photo of me taking a photo of them, taking a photo of a machine that digs holes. But skip forward to 2010, and we have a great hole, and it's filled with our near detector. And there's all different constituent parts. This uh, area all the way around the edge and along that you see there. I really need my pointer, but it's the bit that's covered in scaffolding. That was all made by the UK. That's the bit that is what's known as the electromagnetic calorimeter. The front portion there is what's known as the pi zero detector. It detects pions, which are one of those constituent particles. And that was built in America. 
Then we've got the big magnet, that's the big red thing around the end, that puts it all in a nice magnetic field so that we can look at the curvature of particles that are affected by a magnetic field so we can better determine what particles what. And there's a number of different detectors which I'm not going to go into, but they all work together from built by nations from around the world costing millions of pounds and using cutting edge technology, I should say. So all of these technologies, yes, they're expensive, but they're brand new and they're really at the forefront of what they can do. The magnets, the uh, time projection chambers, which I'm not going to talk much about, but they're the most fundamental now of our time, built for T2K. And these have huge knock-on effects for the rest of the world as well, because you, it's very hard to come up with something very cutting edge if you're very goal-orientated. However, if you're thinking about doing a particle physics experiment and you need something that's completely precise, you can come up with this apparatus precisely for that. And then other people, like doctors and such, go, hang on, we could use this for other things. So we've got our beam, and we understood our beam, and we've sent it 295 kilometers across Japan, and then, as I say, we then detect it. This is a picture inside Super Cameo Candle. It's one of the world's largest detectors. Um, the little silver balls all the way around it are what's known as photomultiplier tubes. They're like anti-light bulbs. A light bulb, you give it electricity, and it gives you light. We give it light, and it gives us electricity of type. So we really give it electrons. And there are literally thousands of these things all the way around, 50,000 in fact, I think, is that right, 50,000? Don't quote me on that number. But uh, a, very, a very large number of these things. And uh, the reason that you can actually have this beautiful picture, if you look at the scale, over there on the right-hand side is three men on a boat. So that is the scale of this thing. We were very lucky that uh, some of them needed replacing a few years back and we were able to go in and take a picture, which was very exciting. Um, the water is completely pure. It's pure H2O, the purest you can get. Uh, um, one of my colleagues actually had long hair and inadvertently it dangled into the water and he found that the, the water went up his hair and his scalp all started flaking off. It's actually very nasty stuff, pure water. It's not at all what you drink. And, um, but it needs to be very pure because we need to be able to see these neutrinos going through it. Normally, it's full up with water all the way to the top. And when it is, you can detect Cherenkov light. Now, this is a picture looking down on a nuclear reactor, and this light's real, it's not put on. And that is particles being accelerated faster than the speed of light in the material they're in. So, in water, it's about 1.5 times the, um, the uh, 1.5 less than the speed of light in air. So, it's much slower. The speed of light in water is much slower than the speed of light in air. You'll see that if you put your hand in the water and it looks bent, for example. Um, so when, the, when this Cherenkov light is produced by these incredibly fast-moving particles, they let off Cherenkov light because they are then travelling faster than the speed of light in water. And this Cherenkov light can be detected in these photomultiplier tubes, which take in this light and output electricity. And when they flash, we can literally do a counting experiment. So these are some real events. On the left-hand side, we've got a muon neutrino. And on the right-hand side, we've got an electron neutrino. Now, you'll note they're actually labeled muon and electron. That's because it's the muon and electron that we actually observe, not the neutrino. When a muon is traveling faster than the speed of light in water, it emits Cherenkov light in a very clean ring. Electrons <coughs> coming out like that top diagram. And you get a very nice, sharp, clean ring literally in a cone of light coming out. When an electron travels through, each subsequent electron that it then emits in Cherenkov light subsequently also emits a shower of electrons. The end effect this has is you get the cone of electron light coming off the particle moving through, but its light gives subsequent light. So this, light, this ring gets very fuzzy, and you end up with this fuzzy ring like we see on the right. And literally all we do is we count up the electron neutrinos and we count up the muon neutrinos. We already know what number they were at the beginning and we look for differences and we take into account all of the factors of the Earth they've travelled through um, and everything else to make sure that we are certain of how many we have. 
And this takes a hell of a lot of people. It takes about 500 people from 12 countries and around 60 institutes all over the world working together completely collaboratively to do that, which has the, lots of benefits for uh, lots of things, including particle physics. You see there's quite a large UK contingent there um, of the institutes that are working on T2K. So we're, we're very heavily involved in this. And good to be so because the first electron neutrino appearance measurement was made at T2K. It was the very first time any experiment had seen muon neutrinos change into electron neutrinos. Then there was the unfortunate earthquake, which uh, was a testimony to Japan's incredible infrastructure that within the space of a few months they were back up and running. Um, however, it did allow the Chinese to get in with their double show reactor neutrino experiment, and then they were the first to what's known as five sigma. And five sigma is simply a way of saying when it's more, when we're, we're certain of it to that level, then it's considered a discovery. We're now um, quite a lot further beyond that, and T2K has the highest number of electron neutrino events, so it's still the leading experiment back up and running, leading the field again. It's also made measurements of the mass hierarchy. Um, so I told you they're all. They've all got a sort of mass associated with them. We don't really know whether you can consider the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. Well, it's mm, difficult to explain. There's a, each neutrino is both a constituent of flavor and mass. And we're not really sure which way round the mass is, which one's heavier and which one's lighter, mass one, mass two, or mass three, which are all part of the constituent neutrinos. I shouldn't have mentioned this, but it was a really nice plot. So I'm sorry that probably, unless you actually knew something about this to begin with, I've just confused the hell out of you. Ignore that. It's a nice plot. Look it up. Um, the thing to take away is that this is some uh, really groundbreaking results that are coming in all the time, and it's been running now for a good few years. So the future is very, very bright. But that done, it's not the only way to do particle physics, and it's not the only thing that we can see. Oh, I should mention one very important thing that actually when we combine the T2K results with other neutrino oscillation experiments, which gives us even more data and even more um, understanding, we can look in reactor sectors, we can look in different areas of neutrinos. We can look at, I told you that neutrinos are made in the sun, they're also made in the atmosphere. We can look at all these different neutrinos coming from all these different places to understand neutrino oscillations. And when we combine all that data, the currently literally hot off the press as of Christmas, um, some theorists were saying this really suggests that they might violate this symmetry, this universal symmetry, more than anything else. That the maximum amount they could, the maximum amount it was possible to, it suggests we might actually see. Which is really, really exciting. This would be the first distinctive uh, demonstration of asymmetry in this sector, in the fundamental particle sector. But there's more to particle physics, there's other ways to do things and there's more to say. And as I say, this is a bit of a history and a bit of a tour. So, protons and neutrons, core of the nucleus. Pretty much protons positive, neutrons neutral, helpful first letter. But is that, true, strictly speaking, true? Well, perhaps not. One experiment right now, cryo neutron EDM, which is looking, for, in, which is in the Institut La Longue in Grenoble, France, is currently looking to see if, in fact, that might not be the case. We already know there's little bar magnets, if you will, inside the neutron. We already know that the neutron um, has this ability, has this sort of this polarized, the ability to be polarized. That's how we do MRI scanners. We line up all the neutrons in a, in a line, all facing in the same direction using this little bar magnet effect. So we know that's the case. But are they electrically neutral? Like static electricity, you can rub it and you can find that your hair then starts to stand on end, which I shouldn't have done when I've just realized I'm on camera. And, uh, but this electrical charge should be evenly distributed within the neutron, right? It's an electrically neutral, positive neutrons, positive and negative, it's distributed evenly within. But actually, even the standard model suggests that it's not evenly distributed inside. But it does suggest it at an incredibly small level, which would have very little bearing on, on what we're here to, to try and understand, i.e. the universe. 
But basically, every theory that goes beyond the standard model, and a lot of experimentalists test a lot of the theories that come out all the time, and theorists are working away, doing complicated maths and trying to understand why it is that the world behaves the way it is and what we could mathematically say one way or the other. And part of our job as experimentalists is to see which of these are practical and which of these are possible and test those that are. And this is certainly the job of the electric dipole moment experiment. So the little, um, the little picture there on the right is zooming in and out on a neutron, if you will. So if you imagine positive and negative charges, when you get further and further away and the neutron becomes smaller and smaller, you can't tell the difference between them. So what we're literally doing is looking inside the neutron on an incredibly small scale. Why do we care? Well, if we see this non-zero EDM, it's another one of these processes that could violate symmetry. In fact, we think it definitely should, especially if it goes beyond the standard model explanation. In all the theories beyond, it certainly does. It's also a thing about testing those theories. In fact, cryo-EDM has ruled out, and neutron-EDM before it, have ruled out more theories than any other particle physics experiment to date, which is quite exciting, because there's a lot of theories come out, and you really need to push the boundaries. So even if we're not discovering something, we're not putting our finger on where that electric dipole moment might be, what smaller scale it might be at, putting a limit on it tells us an incredible amount, and it rules out an incredible amount. And the current world limit is held by the predecessor of the experiment, which is uh, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 26 e centimetres, is how that's recorded. Don't worry too much about that, just remember the value. And this is really the, the same as if you expanded a neutron, you blew up a neutron to the size of the known universe, it would be like looking at a football inside it. So the EDM is the width of the football inside the neutron, which is the universe. So that's the kind of scale we're going at. And I think it's quite incredible what you can do. Particle physics isn't just about bashing stuff together and seeing what comes out. Sometimes it's a, a lot more delicate than that, shall we say. So how do we do this? Okay, so as I say, cryoneutron neutron EDM at ILL in Grenoble. The experiments there, you see the, uh, you can see the nuclear reactor there, which I put the green arrow to, and literally just to the left of that is, uh, is where the experiment actually is. What's the point of having a nuclear reactor? Well, we need to make neutrons, and nuclear reactions make, nuclear reactors make tons of them. And we then need somehow to store these neutrons, which is very, very hard to do. So how do we do it? Well, we make the neutrons in the nuclear reactor, we send them, vertically up this uh, vertical guide tube there, the, the, nucle the neutrons are made in this bottom here, send them vertically up so they're going against gravity, so they're losing some of their energy going upwards, much like water if you send it upwards, anything which you send it against gravity loses some of its energy, you lose some of your energy, you slow down. We make it very, very cold during this process, and when it gets to the very top, there's a sort of fan system, and if you imagine, as your neutron's coming along, it's hitting a fan, and the fan isn't going against the neutron, it's going in the same direction as the neutron, but it's going much slower. And in so doing, this turbine, as it's called, actually slows down the path of the neutrons further. And all of this allows us to be able to store them. Now, what I would like to do at this point, um, and I'm not sure if I actually am online, is just show you a little really, really nice BBC, uh, which I should have set up in advance, so apologies for this. Um, okay, so we make it, oh gosh, sorry this. So we make it cold. I talked about when it comes out, when the neutrons come out of the nuclear reactor, they have to be very cold to slow them down. Cooling things makes them lose energy. And how we do that is any cryogenic apparatus works in this way. You have a series of vessels inside one another. You start off with a vacuum, then you move on to nitrogen, maybe you've got gas in there, maybe you start with liquid nitrogen, then you have liquid helium, 
And in the middle of this particular one, with vacuum chambers in between each, there are various different designs, but the general idea is colder and colder fluids separated by periods of vacuum, allowing you in the centre to have a very, very, very cold system. And in fact, it's so cold in cryo-EDM that it's very close to absolute zero. It's minus 272.65 degrees centigrade. And we achieve this by it sitting in this superfluid helium. And that superfluid helium does an incredible thing. And I want to, you to see this because no one can explain it as well as this is done, so let's just watch it. And hope that it's loud. So here you can see, oh gosh, that does not blow up well. Can't see that at all. Apologies, this should have been tested before I started. Why is this not sharing properly? Do you know why it's not sharing? Because it's full screen, maybe? No, it's not showing up at all there. Ah. Um, is it looking at a different desktop? Never mind. It would have been nice, but we're not going to see it. So I'm going to describe it to you, and you are going to go away and on YouTube look for superfluid helium. That's the search term. It's a brilliant one minute 45 discussion of this, um, which is just incredible to see. You just won't believe when you see it, if you didn't know about it before. And if you did, it's worth seeing again because it's brilliant. I still love it. Let me explain it to you. Basically, superfluid helium, you cool it and cool it and cool it and cool it and cool it. You cool helium, cool helium, cool helium. And it's, very, it's all bubbling away and it's going really fast and it's trying to cool down, it's cooling down and then it gets to this superfluid point and it just goes completely still. And it has the ability then to travel through other materials. So you could be holding a cup, which the helium will just sit in, perfectly fine, because it's a liquid, and of course liquid sits in the cup. But as soon as it becomes superfluid, it has the ability to travel through the particles of the cup, through the molecules of the cup, and come out the bottom. It also has the ability to climb the sides of the cup, come over and down. And you don't even see this happening, because it's such a thin film. All you see is all of a sudden, you're, so you're holding at a, a very long arm's length, because it's very, very cold. This, uh, this sort of bubbling, cooling liquid, all of a sudden, completely still, and then it's just pouring out of the bottom. And it's really incredible, and you can watch this online. It's one minute, 45 seconds, it's just brilliant. And this is the stuff that we need to hold to get our neutrons as cold as they can be. Why do they need to be as cold as they can be? Because if they were just darting around at the speed they do, we would never be able to look inside them. We need to hold them still and look inside them. So we make them really cold. And then we need to do this polarizing thing, this is why I'm a particle physicist and not an artist. This was the best I could do. These are, these are eight neutrons, and they're all polarized in the same direction. And uh, what a brilliant depiction. Could you need more? No, I'm pretty sure not. That's, uh, that's one of the best. So all your neutrons are lined up in the same way, much like the RN MRI scanner. That's how it works. This is technology that we all very well understand. So we have them all lined up, we have them really cold, we have them stored in this superfluid helium in the centre, so they're not really moving either. And then we do some clever business with electric fields and magnetic fields. Again, I don't want to go into it too much, because this is very much a whistle-stop tour, and I want you to take away the key concepts from all of these ideas, rather than going too deeply into any of them, but questions are welcome. So we put on the electric and magnetic field, and we, they should all be pointing upwards, then when we vary the field, we should see them popping downwards. But some of them, if the electric charge is not even distributed within, then they won't all be pointing upwards and then all pointing downwards when we make this stop. Some of them are going to behave differently because some of them are also going to be affected by this offset and positive and negative charge. And it's that that we're looking for. So after we've done all this complicated stuff with nuclear reactors, electric fields, magnetic fields, superfluid helium, cryogenic chambers, we actually come down once again to a counting experiment. We simply look and we see how many are affected one way and how many are affected the other way and what offset there are. And as I say, all of this has led us once again to the world limit. We've ruled out literally hundreds of theories. The paper is online, 2006, that's its, uh, that's its location if you want to give it a Google. And um, it will explain all of this in just the detail that I've whetted your appetite for but didn't have time for in an hour, so do do that. But of course, there's not just the experiments that look at neutrons and neutrinos, there's not just those types of physics, there's many other things. There are the very wonderful experiments which collide things together 
and apply protons together to be literal and get, recreate the conditions 10 seconds after the Big Bang. And it might seem like it's exactly the same time, but actually that's really decades in our terms. In fact, more than decades, it's millennia in, in our current mindset of, of how the world changes, how the universe changes. It changed a huge amount in that time. But by having this 27 kilometer uh, ring, 175 meters deep, just around Lake Geneva there, we have four particle physics experiments looking at different things there. The two perhaps you know the best are ATLAS and, and CMS, which have worked completely separately. There are other sides of the rings. They're completely separate collaborations. There was even a funny uh, April Fool news report that went out uh, one, two years ago, I believe, that said that they'd all gone to a pub in Geneva and had a massive fight and been thrown out because they didn't get on that well. But we don't want them to get on. We want them to work completely separately because if you discover something, maybe you did something wrong, maybe you didn't understand something, maybe if you've got two completely distinct people working on two completely distinct ideas, two completely distinct technologies looking at the same thing and they both find the same answer, which they did, then you can say we're really, really quite sure this is true. And we have done. This is Atlas. And this is a man inside the very empty atlas. This wouldn't be possible if, um, if uh, it was full, obviously, because it would be all full of detectors. And much like when we saw this is now on its side, and we're looking sideways, and not like looking down the hole on the T2K detector. And this thing is vastly huge. This is really, really big. And CMS, which has a similar, it has to go around the beam. So in both cases, the uh, detectors are fan out from the beam. But they're very different systems which um, I won't go into. There will be a lot of talks on that uh, sort of uh, ideas and on those specific experiments and detectors. They will happen as part of this series, I'm sure. If you're interested in those, then I suggest that you come to them and hear about it in a lot of detail, because they're very interesting. And this is the money plot. This is one of the money plots. There's also a nice combined plot, but I didn't show it here, because it's not as easy to demonstrate the effect, because you don't have such a, a, a prominent peak in the way. It's just, it is just as prominent, in fact, it's more prominent, but it's not shown in this way. Because of that, I like to show this plot. That's your Higgs, right there. 125 GeV, beautiful. And of course, what did that lead to? A Nobel Prize. So we now have another Nobel Prize in the UK. It's very exciting. We have a new Nobel Prize for particle physics. And about uh, 5,000 of my colleagues have worked on an experiment which has won the Nobel Prize for the theory involved. And that is a really big deal. That is really, really exciting. But it's not the whole picture and it's not the end. We've found the Higgs, sure. There's way, way more to find. There's way more to find at the LHC. But also, eventually, we're going to be limited in what we can do. We're going to be limited in the energy with which we can make these protons. We're going to be limited with the speed we can hit them together. We're going to be limited. In... So what do we do? Where do we go now? Well, pretty much everyone agrees in particle physics that uh, the holy grail would really be a muon collider, this heavy electron. And here is a picture, when you search holy grail particle physics, what you get is this picture of Tom Hanks and someone else in a film looking at the antimatter reactor and saying, oh my gosh, it's the holy grail, it's antimatter particle physics. That's all rubbish, don't worry about that. Um, what they should be saying is what these speech bubbles show. What wonder if we could have a muon collider. And this as well, what if we could make many, many, many more neutrinos? We could really work to understand all those little things, that math problem that I was taught, that I touched upon earlier. We understood the hierarchies. We could look at all of the neutrino interactions really, really closely. We'd like a neutrino factory. And uh, unlike 2012, where there's actually a point where he opens this up, opens up the lid and goes, oh my God, the neutrinos have mutated. And it's just crazy. Neutrinos don't mutate. You can't see them. You definitely wouldn't open a lid and see them all in there just mutating. Like, oh my god, they mutated! Ah. Hilarious film. Nearly cried in the cinema. What he should have said was, no way, that's ridiculous! Hang on though. Imagine if there were lots of neutrinos and we made them in a factory. This is supposed to be a picture of a mouse. Imagine a cute mouse. Basically, I had a picture of a mouse on my phone. I was like, I'm going to transfer this onto the talk when I get there so I can use a specific mouse. It's my friend's pet mouse. It's really cute. However, I didn't do that. Now it's just an empty slide and it's not a very funny joke, but nonetheless, 
mice. It's not that kind of mouse, it's not the cute pet mouse, it's the muon ionization cooling experiment and perhaps the future of particle physics. It's what takes us from the LHC proton collider really large diameter rings which will eventually be limited in the next decade. It takes us from these neutrino experiments into being able to really make a factory for neutrinos. So you're probably thinking what is muon ionization cooling? Hopefully you're thinking that and not what time is it? This is muon ionization cooling in a nutshell, and like with everything else, it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop, but everything you need to know is on this slide. You get a beam of muons, those heavy electrons. That's exactly the same way we make a beam of neutrinos, because the muons change into neutrinos, they emit neutrinos as they change. So this is how we can use it for a neutrino factory. The muon beam could also be collided with another muon beam, of much higher energies. And to do that would need a much smaller ring than this 27 circumference, kilometer circumference LHC. It would also mean that extensions to it would be smaller, higher energy, and much more uh, likely to discover things in that, that tricky 10, first 10 seconds that we're looking at. So how do we do it? We get a, meme, a, be, a beam of muons. Now, this looks like a diagram of the beam itself, it's not. It's a momentum cylinder. So the length of the cylinder is its forward, it is what's called its longitudinal momentum, its momentum in the longitudinal direction. The diameter of the cylinder is the transverse momentum, the spread of momentum outwards. So at the moment, there's quite a big momentum spread. We want to try and make that smaller because we want to try and collide these things really accurately in order to get to this high energy point. At the moment, it would be too big, you'd lose the beams, it wouldn't work, it's not possible. How do we do this? Well, we use rocket fuel. Well, at least a large constituent of it, liquid hydrogen. We make an absorber, it's called an absorber, because the muon beam travels through the liquid hydrogen, ionizing as it goes, losing this transverse momentum, and now our moment, and also its longitudinal momentum, it loses momentum all the ways around through this ionization process. In so doing, our momentum cylinder has now become much smaller. Now that's great, but it's quite nice that things keep going, longitudinal momentum going strong. So we want to re-accelerate them. We want to keep this acceleration going. So we use something called an RF cavity, which uses electric fields to accelerate these particles again faster. So you've got your muons, they're travelling in a straight line, they're going along, they start ionising, they lose energy, and therefore they just become a little bit slower. And then they hit the RF cavity and they get sped up, but not transversely, only longitudinally. So now our momentum cylinder goes back to the original length it was, but stays at this reduced transverse momentum. The literal term for this is reduced emittance. It's called the beam emittance. It doesn't in any way relate to what it is, it's just the term for it, so, you know, didn't bother writing on the slide, better that you remember all of this than that. Um, now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, surely that would take a little bit of heating as well, because doing all of that work makes heat, and, that, you know, and that's very true. The reason that we use liquid hydrogen, because you could use pretty much anything. You could use beryllium, you could use plastics, you could use all sorts of different things, but you are going to make some heating when you do that. And of course, the heating is going to do crazy things to momentum. It's going to work against the cooling, this sh shrinking. So you want to have a really tight balance between the two, and liquid hydrogen gives you that. Gives you the maximum ionization with the minimum heating. Okay, so why we shouldn't be scared of mice? The future is really bright. In order to build basically any of the really exciting next generation particle physics experiments of this sort of big science era, we really could do with muon ionization cooling. We could do with these muon beams that we could collide together. We could do with these muon beams of the right energy to make the neutrino factory. We could really do with all of this stuff. And um, there's the potential to use this to look for this dark matter as well. So that extra 27% of the universe that we know nothing about, but we know it's there because we can feel the gravity. Well, perhaps if we could look at this muon beam and collide them in this way, we'd be able to do that. Now this is the actual schematic of the experiment. I have included, haven't included a picture. Interestingly, it's the only particle physics experiment in the UK. I can't believe I haven't said that yet. It's at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Didcot, which is near Oxford. It's our very own born and bred particle physics experiment, so you should all be very excited about it. It's not in Geneva, it's not in France, it's not in Japan. It's here. 
And this is what it looks like drawn on a piece of paper. In reality, at the moment, I tried to put some pictures on, but there's a lot of works going on because we're really at the cusp. We're about to start now, and everything's going in. So all pictures are covered in bits of cable, and it just doesn't look very impressive. It looks a bit like a mess. Imagine a metal building site. That's what it looks like now. But that's because we're building towards this. So that's your beam of muons coming in. These toffs and Cherenkovs, they're detectors that allow you to toffs the time of flights. Um, so quite easy to think, what do they do? They recall the time of flight, the muons. Again, we want to understand, in order to know if we're really cooling the beam, if we're really making this emittance smaller, if we're making this transverse momentum smaller, we need to, just like with T2K, when we did the neutrinos, we need to understand it at the beginning. That is the purpose of these detectors. Then there's the tracking detectors, which the label at the very bottom here pointing to those, they are what I am personally responsible for. And they actually detect the muons themselves and therefore can make the um, emittance measurement in, along with the other detectors, but they're the, the sort of the, the meatiest detectors, if you will. The blue circles are the liquid hydrogen absorbers and the coil-like things are the currents, the RF that is accelerating them. We're going to do it in two stages. So at first, there will be no RF, there'll just be an absorber. So like with everything, money is very limited and particle physics funding is, uh, is certainly, um, what is the diplomatic word? Sought after. And therefore, um, we will do it in stages. The first stage, as I say, is being is almost ready to go now. Next year is the, the starting point. This year, in fact, for the very first point where we make sure everything's nicely aligned, we actually do get muons, we actually do do some simple physics, but we don't do the cooling. So we do everything except for actually cooling. Um, this year, next year, we're going to see the cooling effect of that absorber. So that's where the overall transverse longitude momentum is reduced. Then, two years later, we put in the RF. All of the cavities are already being built. It's already tried and tested, so don't worry. We'll still be going. And four years from now, the future will be very, very bright. Now, maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, this is all very lovely, but what's it ever done for me? Well, it's done a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to go away and Google a lot of the things from this talk. I hope they are, anyway. And you wouldn't be able to do that without the web. You at least wouldn't be able to be on Facebook right now emailing your friends that some really boring bird is going on at you. Um, NMRI scanners, um, hopefully none of us will ever have to use them, and I'm sure a lot of us will. PET scanners, the same. Um, again, we build this technology, it has to be cutting edge uh, to, in order to do these very intricate things, looking inside mu and neutrons and, and making these really concise beams that hit each other, the magnets that are required, all of these things. That's how we then go on to do these wonderful uh, breakthroughs in medicine and engineering, etc., etc. Proton therapy for cancer, in fact, is a particularly great example. A new, uh, new, four new proton facilities are planned for the UK. Very exciting. Um, one of the only Western countries not to have them at the moment, and a great way to uh, rid the world. So, as I say, it's been a very whistle-stop -top tour. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. The things to take away from this talk are only 5% of the world, of the universe, is this ordinary matter, me, you, tables, chairs, the world, the universe, the galaxies, the stars. We know that none of that matter, including the dark matter, the extra 27%, all of this is all matter, none of it's antimatter, and it really shouldn't exist, because it should be. There should be antimatter, and they should annihilate, and it shouldn't, we shouldn't be here. So why are we? That's the questions that we want to answer. We don't know, we're trying. And there are many ways we do this. We don't only do it at the LHC by colliding particles together and looking at what they make. We also do it by looking at the way, the, the way that new particles interact, the way that particles change, the neutrinos oscillating from one type to another, looking for these variations in symmetry that would have created this matter-dominated universe. <coughs> We look inside the neutron to see if actually they're not electrically neutral. Actually, there is some dispersion when you look on a small enough scale. The particles as well, that's a list there. There's no point in me listing them again, but uh, good things to know. And, um, and of course, the muon collider, the holy grail to particle physicists, which I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying. It very much is the holy grail to physics. Um, and it's an exciting thing. If we can do this, we can do marvellous, marvellous things in the field, and the, and the future is truly bright. 
So thank you very much for listening. If you would like to know more about any of those experiments, I would suggest those search terms will get you pretty much everything you need to know. I've put Sussex in brackets because um, cryo-EDM is very much led by Sussex. The neutron EDM work with, uh, with that world limit also led by Sussex and lots of exciting breakthroughs and papers from here itself. So you can look at your local local work and of course in mice as well, not, not too far away, just a couple of hours away is the mice experiment. So there's lots of uh, homegrown excitement here as well. So I hope you'll enjoy searching for that. Thank you very much. Um, we're actually now at the point where we're starting to think about what we can do to open this up to people, um, both PR-wise, talking more to the media, social media, the general media, in inviting people. Um, it's something that's very exciting. They do it at the LHC. You can go and visit Atlas. You can go and look around. Um, T2K, less so, um, but to some degree. Um, and so, yeah, it's something we're starting to think about, and I think, I would hope, and I would be kind of surprised if it doesn't happen in the next few years at least. So, uh, yeah, watch this space. Any other questions? Hi. This sounds like a stupid question, but it probably is from your point of view, but not from mine. No such thing as a stupid question. You know, having sort of done things with Brunson Burners and stuff in, in chemical labs and physics at school, Well, that's, uh, that's really quite an interesting point, and I'm gonna, uh, the reason I'm skipping back through the slides is because I want to show you something that, even beyond just us coordinating us, to build these great big huge facilities is, is not necessarily the easiest thing. If you look at this J-Park facility, you'll see that it's a big rectangle there of buildings, and there's that big sandy line all the way down the middle of it, going to that rather beautiful beach that's somewhat covered by our experiment. Well, the reason is that at the top of that bit of sand is a Japanese shrine, a Shinto shrine. And it is necessary in Japanese Shinto culture for the uh, dwellings of the shrine um, to be able to have free access to spirits backwards and forwards to the beach. So even though there's this multi-billion pound experiment there, there is a huge pathway unhindered through the whole thing. And you, ha you, have, you can't cross it at all. You have to go all the way around to get in the other bit because you need to take into account what the local people are saying. You need to take into account local knowledge, local culture. You need to communicate in a very <coughs> diplomatic fashion at times, sometimes very undiplomatic. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it can be a very interesting thing. In fact, I know, I'm not sure if I should say this on the radio, um, but um, I know the Atlas group once had a meeting coordinated group set up to minimise meetings. And my colleagues would sit in the office having a meeting discussing how to minimise the number of meetings they were having because no one was able to do any work. And it's actually quite difficult to coordinate it, you know, especially with those collaborations with 5,000 people. Everyone's working on their own thing, everyone wants to get their own thing out. And maybe, and you. A very famous physicist once said, organising particle physics is like trying to herd cats. You don't, you don't really manage people. We don't like to be managed. Or kind of people just go off and do their own kind of crazy thing. Like, no, I'm doing this. So, um, so it's not without its trials and tribulations. And uh, probably every story that could happen in industry or the wider world probably has happened in particle physics. And uh, we just, you just have to smile and get on with it, I think. <laughs> Thankfully, in the end, it, uh, it it tends to work out. So we we all because we all want the same goal. So, but, yes. Um, with the uh, mind experiment with the collision of muons, what sort of results are you looking for that would sort of further particle physics? Well, we're actually that's a very good question. We're looking for a ten percent reduction in the emittance of the beam. 
So that's this transverse momentum, and we want that to be reduced by 10%. That would be um, enough to do a muon collider. It would be enough to do a neutrino factory, and it's a great proof of principle of what we can do. Um, it would be far beyond anything that had already been achieved. And um, we also want to be able to measure that to 0.1% accuracy, which is, I think, two orders of magnitude greater than we previously had. So we want to make sure that we're measuring it as accurately as we possibly can so that we're not bringing in any other kind of systematic errors into this. So it's quite a huge feat on both counts. If we could do this 0.1 and 10% reduction, then we're really well placed for the muon collider. And that would be enough proof of principle that work could start. So it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, and as everything, so the first emittance paper, again, this word, transverse momentum paper, it's called the emittance paper. If you search mice emittance, there's a nice paper. And it's only about six pages long. So even if it's a bit like, oh, like it's, it's very interesting. It's a bit complicated at places, but it explains this concept of emittance. It explains the maths, which I haven't had time to do so here. And it's only six pages long, so it can't take you that long. Great read, give it a read. And um, that also shows that we, um, we're making the measurements at a level that we can expect to be making those 0.1% measurements. And we're um, on target for what we think we can do with the cooling. So it's exciting times. Yes? Um, the recent study suggests that the gravitational constant might fluctuate time and space. If that was so, would that uh, change the standard model? If that was so, it might lead to things that would, uh, that would change the standard model. And I think, are you talking about the Planck result? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, also, that really has confirmed dark energy. So, it's, there's, it's a very interesting idea. It's certainly, there is, we don't know whether it's true or not, we need to understand it. The cosmological constant has always seemed to be true, but we actually don't have a very good handle on it anyway. It changes quite significantly as, as time goes on in what we believe it to be. Certainly when I started off as an undergraduate, it was a very different number to it is now, and I'm not that old, I like to think anyway. So, um, you know, it, it's a very evolving, very fast evolving field. Now, I don't work on that experiment. I have heard a couple of interesting talks on it. And I think the best thing to say is it, it won't, it, if anything is confirmed to be different to how it is, it will have incredible knock-on effects. So it is very exciting. And that is a, a cosmology experiment that's going out and doing more of the astrophysics side of things. And it goes to show that not only we're working with the particle physicists, we're also working with the astrophysicists. Um, so we all have to work very much together um, to come up with the idea. And as I say, we're still a long way off from knowing but it's a very exciting result. It's a very exciting result, and we'll just have to wait and see. Uh... There's also a lot of theory, so you should always, there's a lot of things that you can do with physics. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And when these theories come out, they can be very exciting. They can be, you know, you need to, if you read something in a newspaper, and you think, oh gosh, this has just happened, Google it. Search some actual physics papers. Look at what the field are saying about it, because it'll be really interesting, and maybe you'll see some good fights as well, and everyone likes a good fight. So, you know, really research around the issues. I think that's true of everything in life, especially now when you can pretty much write anything on the internet. But, um, you know, always research around it, because there's lots of interesting stuff that relates directly to that, which will answer your question much better than I can. And there'll be people right now sitting down having a big fat argument about, is it this, is it that? No, but surely the results are something different, and what would this mean? And I'm sure there will be lots of very interesting literature on it, beyond even what I can say, which is basically, yes, it would. <laughs> I think we can make this the last question. Okay. One more. They both went up at this, oh my gosh. <laughs> Should we do those three of the last questions? Because I don't want to pick. Right. Um, you get the neutrinos from the supernovas. Yes. Do they get picked up? Yeah, 1987 supernova, which was, I think there was actually a supernova recently, but it was the wrong type of supernova, which literally, uh, literal, literal story, I was in the cinema, you could drink wine in my local cinema, fabulous cinema, I'm sitting there with a glass of wine, and, um, and then my friend, who just went, oh, but wasn't there just a supernova? And I went, what? And literally threw this wine all over my coach, which was next to me, thankfully it wasn't a person, but it turns out, you know, wrong type of supernova. 
But um, yeah, I was very excited. I was like, oh my gosh, look at the Cameo Cando data. But, um, and it's also really good because all of the neutrino detectors all around the world have the potential to see the supernova at the same time or there'll be some difference and actually those differences can have an effect, those similarities have an, an interesting effect. And we actually saw with the 1987 supernova that Cameo Cande and... The name eludes me, of course it does. Um, I don't know if it was. It may have been. May have been. Anita. Was it running then? I don't know. Anyway, they all basically saw it at exactly the same moment. They all saw the neutrinos coming from this, and it very much gives us a lot of very exciting um, data. So, yeah, they do come from supernova. They can also help to tell us about um, the internal reactions in supernova that we don't actually know that much about because a number of neutrinos that we see tell us things, the distance that they are, etc. So that's quite interesting. Um, and yeah, we've been waiting since 1987. Now we have such greater capacity. There's an extra couple of neutrino detectors. There's Snow Lab in Canada. There's um, others in America. There's in China. Really, if a supernova happened now, you would throw your wine over your coat and gladly so because, um, yeah, it would be very exciting. And the yeah. um, your T2K, did I understand you correctly? You said that um, you fire the neutrinos across Japan and you count them. Given that neutrinos don't seem to ever interact with much, I'm intrigued as to A, how you count them, and B, how you make sure they're going in the right direction. Ah, oh, two very good questions. We know they're going in the right direction because we have, which I haven't shown here, because of this whistle-stop tour, it would be on it if I didn't go so in-depth, but uh, we have what's called the Ingrid detector, and it sits in front of the, uh, in front of the near detector. On, so, the beam, I'm going to have to go into this now. So basically, you make a neutrino beam, and there's a spread to it, obviously, as you rightly say. It's not just going to go in a pointy line. And actually, we find that the oscillation is maximum with the minimum background noise from other things happening, other interactions, other neutrinos and other things. If we don't detect the beam straight on, but we detect it two and a half degrees off to one side. So our far detector and our near detector are positioned at a two and a half degree angle from the main center of the beam. This is where we see uh, the most electron neutrinos, minimal backgrounds. <coughs> So on the on axis, two and a half degrees away, we have something called the Ingrid detector. And what that does is it's a series of uh, detectors that form a sort of giant cross. And they accurately position the center of the beam. I'm going to go with, I think it's one centimeter. If it's anything different, it's less, certainly not more. So we know it very, very well, the actual beam center. And because of this cross shape, we know the beam spread as well. So we very well understand its shape, and therefore we can continue the shape along, because you rightly say they don't interact, they don't change, so we know how it's going to be. We count them at the near detector, this two and a half degrees off, because we want to count the actual path that's going to continue to the far detector. So we count them using that series of detectors. We do that by when the neutrinos interact with another nucleus, um, they will continue to go, but... Um, you'll find an electron and electron neutrino emitted, and we can detect the electron, or we can detect the muon that goes with the muon neutrino. So we actually detect those things which get that get sort of output from this interaction. So the neutrino will keep on going. We won't see it's gone, but we can see these other particles, and we know that they're made from them because we very well understand the interaction. We very well understand the angle they should be at. We understand the energy they should be at. We understand. We've got the curvature I mentioned because of the magnets. So we know like the electrons and muons are affected by that field. So we can look at the curvature. That tells us a lot of things as well. So we can accurately determine where the particle was, what it was, what energy it was, etc. Um, and we do exactly the same counting experiment at the far end. Only this time we do it using this Cherenkov light. And this is, again, you're not detecting the electron neutrino itself. You're detecting the product from it the muon or the electron. And as they travel faster than the speed of light in water, then this Cherenkov radiation of electrons comes out and we literally just count those rings. You might notice there's no tau. At the moment, we don't detect tau neutrinos at Cameo Candy. 
So we're only looking at muons that go electron neutrino to muon neutrino and muon neutrino to electron neutrino. But we can understand very well what they are at the beginning and the end. And we can work forward to work out what's disappearance and what's appearance. And we have papers in both of these fields. There was one more question. This is it, yeah. Um, so neutrinos fluctuate in between. Um, so they must kind of lose energy to fluctuate down, but they also gain energy. Otherwise, they'd all just fluctuate down to the next level. But how do they gain the energy to oscillate? They up? don't react in that way. It's not like ions coming out. It's not like electrons being emitted from a surface where they go through energy levels of excitement. It's not the same, it's not the same principle. You remember when I got really stuck because I showed that um, that really nice plot which I really liked but then I couldn't really explain it so I'd have to go so long into it I wouldn't finish the talk? That's how this concept comes into it. That they're actually um, an amalgam of a mass element and a flavour element. Flavour is this electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. And so if you imagine each neutrino is made up of some proportion of mass 1, and flavor one, some proportion of mass two and flavor two, and some proportion of mass three and flavor three. And much like a Newton's cradle connected by strings, which if I had now I could demonstrate, um, these actually change, they give up more, the proportions of one vary to the other. That's what then allows this transference without energy loss, which allows them to keep going forever and ever and ever. So it's not the same function as excitement and ionization and that sort of thing. It's, it's a different, a very different, very unique process. This oscillation is, is very new. And that's what gives rise to us not fully understanding their masses, not knowing what the actual value of mass one, mass two, mass three, which is not equivalent to electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. That's what gives rise to this element. There's a very complicated matrix. It's actually not that complicated. It's only three by three. But there's a matrix that very well describes this. And what we're actually looking for is an angle called theta 1, 3. Again, this is something which I would have gone into more detail of if it was a T2K talk. Um, and we're trying to understand each of the parts of that matrix. The reason is that that 3 by 3 matrix is what then determines the mass one, mass two, mass three, flavor one, flavor two, flavor three components. And understanding those is how we truly understand the oscillation. It's true everything I've said. We do it through counting. We do it through making this beam and looking at it and understanding it and then counting them. But what we're literally counting is not electron neutrino versus muon neutrino. We're literally counting this change in these three elements of both. Um, I would definitely Google this further. Um, there's so much great information out there. You've got lots of really nice um, plots and descriptions of neutrino oscillations. It's a very exciting field because for very quickly you can start to actually do these physics studies, rel relatively quickly if you compare to the startup time of a collider like the LHC. Um, and very quickly we're getting very exciting results. So. And as I say, it's the first fundamental direct evidence for physics beyond the standard model. So there's a, a hell of a lot of really, really interesting stuff out there, um, interesting things going on all the time. And uh, so I definitely recommend that you, you have a read of that to understand that a little bit further. It's analogous to the matrix of quark variations, if you know anything about that. It's a very analogous system. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Um,